Pat for giving us a space in a, in a new home um, with good Wi-Fi and computer as usual streaming uh, so anybody out there can watch it after the fact or maybe live uh, and for everybody who made it out here on this rainy uh, Saturday. I don't think we have a speaker who is 100% confirmed for next month, so anybody who has ideas, whatnot, please put them out on the list. Overlog at firemountain.net so that we can have a discussion and figure out who's speaking for um, upcoming meetings. There have been some good topics and some people have expressed interest in speaking, but travel and work and whatnot have gotten in the way. So again, if you have an idea but don't want to speak on it, Float that out there, and there may be someone on the group in the group who can uh, who can speak about that. So I don't even know if it's the uh, I think it may be the week of the second week. At, is it after the election? I think is the first uh, or the second. Wait, it's the first Saturday of the month. No, second. Second. So the second Saturday I think is right after the election. Um, so I may or may not be here. I have tickets for a show in New York that weekend. And it's unclear if we're going up on Saturday or Sunday for a day trip. So uh, I want to thank Peter who stepped in last month. I was at Osiris Rex, which was the NASA launch to go and rendezvous with the um, uh, asteroid. So my brother is one of the lead engineers on that. So we got to watch the, uh, the rocket take off, which is pretty cool if you've never seen it. We decided not to go onto the facility to watch it because um, you know, the event itself is like 20 seconds, um, and getting in and off of the property can be a couple of hours. So we sat and had a drink and ate some food while we watched it go up. And it's funny because you see this plume, and then it must have been a minute, two minutes later, you hear it as it goes off. So it's very impressive. And um, I met a lot of people who go to this uh, location to watch, and they said a lot of these people haven't missed one in years. There are some people who have been going for this? a decade. Cape Canaveral. Went to Getty Park? No, we didn't. We ended up, there's a, uh, there's a bar slash restaurant um, right where, um, it, uh, whatever the road turns into A1A right there, where the um, casino, Floyd and Casinos are. Yeah. So we went there. Um, we were thinking of going to Jetty Park, but we had gotten, we had gone south for the day to hang out at the beach. and. Um, my daughter decided to get her nose pierced, so we took her to a tattoo parlor to get her all done up. You know, what other adult takes their 17-year-old daughter on vacation to get piercings? So, uh, uh, Great. Yeah. Interesting point. If you have military connections, yeah. there is a NASA campground which you can have. They have reciprocal privileges with military uh -huh. campgrounds. And it's right across the water from Cape Canaveral. Huh, okay. So yeah, so we were down there. Uh, my dad was 27 years in the Navy, so my mom was with us. And although my dad's passed 12 years now, a little over 12 years, um, my mom still has her, her card, so we can, we can use those mm -hmm. facilities, which is a. Uh, well, I can give you the contact info if you okay. decide to. Yeah, we'll probably go back for another launch. I mean, it's and try to get closer. It was good. It was just simply a matter of um, my daughter's looking at colleges, so we had gone over to the West Coast to check out colleges. It was a, a lot of driving. It's also very well worth going to see the historical tour. We haven't done that. Go yeah, I did that in 72. That's really cool. <laughs> I imagine it's <laughs> there's a little bit more history than there was then. Well, they start with button. Yeah. And the launch pad and the blockhouse. I mean, yeah. We have a picture of my brother actually. So he worked on the shuttle, and there's a picture of him looking at a mock up of the shuttle. And I think it's in 73, which I didn't realize until we found one of these old photos. Um, but that said, so Peter spoke, uh, I think he's given this talk once, or are you going to be giving You've no, given it once. I've given it once two weeks ago. Um, so that means we're going to get the polished version of it. That is actually uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's on a Grub, Grub and Dre Cut. Um, as usual, everybody feel free. I'm going to cut the lights so that it's a little bit better, I think. I think it, I'll think i see that on the video when you do. Yep. Right now, you are very clear on the video. So, okay. But I don't know what everyone can see. Can everybody see this okay? Yeah? 
Okay, so maybe we'll leave the lights on then. If, if yeah, uh, I will switch to the project on the video in a moment. Okay, so yeah, we'll that. know in a minute. We can if so. If the lights go off, it is by plan. Um, with that said, we'll uh, we'll let Peter, and then we'll open up for questions at the end. And um, I guess that's it. So, Peter. Sure. So first off, I had to use Google Docs. Long story short, and as far as I know, this doesn't work. So I have to sit here and push the keys. <laughs> but I have that so I can actually point. So it's, normally I like to walk back and forth, but it won't be much of that because I have to run over here all the time. So this is all about booting, figuring out how booting works. So when it doesn't boot, you have an idea of how to fix it. So how many here has you know, had that feeling? Not just you know, install is one thing, but Hey, it worked yesterday, and then all of a sudden, you get some awful prompt on the screen, and you have no clue how to fix anything. Right. Yep. Yesterday. Yes. <laughs> uh, this talk is about giving you enough of a structure on where to go look to solve those problems, to understand what's going on behind the scene a bit. It can very easily go very, very deep into these systems, so let me know if we're going too deep. Uh, depending on what problems you have, hardware problems are always tricky because you really have to understand how the hardware works to solve that, right? Good. Okay, so this is what we're going to try to talk about today. We're going to go through just you know, the basic stuff of the boot process. What's involved from we turn on the computer that we have a system up and running, or at least we have Linux as you know it up and running. Um, I am really not going to go into our system D or system B5 and all that and all those details other than a few things to explain how some of those tools work, but that's a complete different talk. We're then going to go into some GWAP fundamentals, which is how does GWAP work, how is it structured, where does, where does everything belong and so on. And then we're going to go into in RAMFS, and I should probably have written DRACOT. So those two things are sort of synonymous. DRACOT is the program that creates the RAM disk that is used to boot. For now, those two things are synonymous, and so we're going to first talk about GRUP, then we're going to go into to, uh, DRACOT, and if I haven't lost you by then, we're going to go into how to diagnose and look at some, some very common scenarios before I actually start some VMs up and we can actually try to do it for real. So that's the plan today. Hopefully we can um, can get there together within two hours. Last time we got kind of a little I decided I made this fun. I, I, I had to figure out how to how do you illustrate a boot with Linux? I, know, I found a boot in Linux, but I don't know if it worked. <laughs> so boot process. What happens from the time you turn on a computer till the oven running? And I do have system D up there. Because most major districts, to, to my knowledge today, that's where we are. I'm really not trying to have that battle. We could replace it with something else. But System D has some additional features when it comes to boot management and figuring out what happens if your system doesn't boot correct. So we actually have quite a bit going on before we are up and running with an OS, right? We, we have the hardware itself which today, with today's standard, is extremely advanced. I mean, it tended to be that unless you knew the, uh, the port number and the, uh, the uh, interrupts or no number, you could not even add a piece of hardware to your system because you literally have to tell your software where to find it. Who's done that in the last 20 years? <laughs> it's all, for most of us, it's all automatic right now. And most people don't even know it's happening because it's that smart. That's the cool part. The bad part is that also puts on some heavy loading on the OS to understand that, and that's where we get all these weird internal systems that communicates with those protocols. So the system actually knows what hardware it has. So you cursed over UWD, or you cursed over uh, what used to be called HAL, and all these different abstraction layers, that's why. So, traditionally, um, so if you were here at the, uh, to talk about UFI, you would know that when we say conventional, this is the process that 
until five, six years ago, was the common standard for, for PCs and servers to boot. And that really is not what we do anymore. Unless you change anything into legacy mode, we don't do this anymore. For lots of reasons that we had last time. Yes, was that a hand? I'm oh, sorry. So, traditionally, this is what we've done all the time. So we all know, we all have called it BIOS from the get-go, right? We all know, go into your setup in the BIOS, even though it really wasn't it, because the BIOS was already done by the time the setup came up. But it's a very limited solution. Little Lead has one megabyte of address, addressable space to do stuff. So all these fancy GUIs that you're now used to before your OS comes up with your mouse working and no way. This is why all those GUIs were extremely simple on those early boxes. Because those boot setups were extremely basic. So some vendors, uh, IBM in particular, they started creating this little special partition. So you booted up a DOS or something else and then they could load up a little more advanced program to help novice users, particularly on servers, because servers become pretty complex with hardware and being able to diagnose them. But they're really, really bad because they're so small and simple that we have to figure out a way of getting around them. They're pretty blind. They just load code. All this computer knows is, well, when you turn on the computer, what's the first thing that happens on the hardware side? How does the computer know how to get started? Let's start there. When you, when you turn it on, how does it go from power mm. on to running something in memory? Uh, going to a well-known address. Yeah, so it has a well-known address, but start, if, if this is RAM. Instruction, right? but, but if there's nothing in memory, how does it get started? Well, yes, it's, it's, only, it's in ROM. It's yeah. in ROM, right? So we have a little piece of ROM still somewhere that gets reflected in, and your processor knows when it turns on to start a certain address. And that's really all there is. That then loads the rest of it. The problem is that that code is just a matter of getting post, meaning to verify that the hardware is actually working. Is there RAM? Is there a video port? I mean, can I talk? And then if not, we get all these beeps, or we get a code on the display somewhere on the main board, or something weird. We know if nothing works at that point, it has nothing to do with the OS. It's all hardware. But once that process is over, as you can see here, once we've done our power self, uh, we come up, then we have some code that is going to be loaded. Right? So the next thing that happened in the old traditional one was if, if it found a disk, it would find what we call you know, the primary disk, the zero, and it will load the first sector. That's where we found our partition table, and that is where we found our boot. So once we do that, then whatever was in that sector would load. Right? And some of our very first viruses, that's what they did. They literally replaced that code with their own code. So before I always started up with all the security, we would already be down the hole of getting some bad code in. And if we went in with our antivirus or whatever, removed it, it came back the moment we rebooted again. Pretty easy to do, because it's just running whatever code we give it. The next problem, and this is one thing that I really like. Yes, sir. Quick question. Hey, uh, how do I get in? Uh, I, I'm going to leave for a few minutes. Or if you come back, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I said, can't get home. No, no, I won't. So I you scan this in front of that little black uh, square beside the door. Yep. And it will. Open. Yeah, I'll be back in an. There's also I'll be back in an hour. I'm told there's an open door on the other side of the building. Uh, yeah. A door opener, Jim. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'll be back soon enough. Yeah. So I'm here for the next couple of hours. But thank you very. Do you want me just to take this, just in case you can do that, yeah. that the world goes to hell. I signed my uh, my life away to get that thing, so you better be that. Don't worry. Hey, sorry for the uh, interruption. I noticed the force and fitness area seems to have a much uh, more deep. Much, uh, yes. <laughs> and the parking lot appears to be full. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry again. You like to work on Saturdays? Wow. Okay. So where were we? Like, so what Brian mentioned was that every vendor seems to also create their own ways of doing the bias. So where do we actually, do, you know, how does it actually work? How do we get in here? Or how can we protect it? They were all defined in different ways depending on vendor. And that was part of the reason we liked certain main boards initially because we understood how that worked. And it wasn't standardized. 
but we end up with very hot with big dependencies. So anyway, to fill up the fulfill the complete process, once we load in the um, the MDR to memory we, and we create we get that first couple hundred bytes of boot code that tells it where to go to boot, and then we boot. So that little initial piece of code is really very really, really small, and all it can tell it is where else to go. In the MS DOS days, all it did was to look for the partition mark as boot in your partition table and go lo load a much bigger sector on that disk, and that was your boot. Peter? Yes? Modern systems have more have boot sector virus protection. So that's what UEFI is about. Well, let's go on. So that process, as I said, was replaced with our trusted boot option. Lights. Right. We need um, lights out. So we need lights out. Contrast is. Um, Greg, I need the lights. Let me switch over here. Thank you. I call it Yeah. OK, so in the UFI world, we sort of still have the computer turning on. The same thing happens. But instead of lo loading a piece of random code that is on a piece of disk that you're providing, this is actually part of what we traditionally would call the, uh, the, you know, the BIOS, or rather the firmware. This is what's in ROM. Um, hold on. I guess we might have another person trying to get in. Hello? Yes. Yeah, OK, we're going to come down and get to it. Oh, someone opened the door. Well, you need to uh, get into uh, when you get to the third floor too. So we'll have someone out there too. Okay. 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 Wow. First time my phone has worked when I was in here. Okay. So as I said, the EFI side of it is not code that you're injecting anymore. It's not your bootloader. It actually comes with the firmware. We do have firmware updates that we can get from the hardware vendor, but it follows the same standards. So once that firmware um, has been set up, initialized to hardware, it actually now applies in very basic rules. It will now apply its logic to verify that whatever you're telling it to boot is, is allowed. And it does that using signatures. It does that by providing some level of validation that what it sees is what it expects. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to take the Microsoft thing away because it knows about that and replace that with my own code. Well, that boot code was signed, and that key is in the BIOS code, the NVRAM that you see up there. And if it doesn't match, it doesn't work. And that was one of the initial reasons that we couldn't boot Linux on these servers, because that feature and depending on who you believe, was turned off initially that we could not add our own stuff. We could not get into a insecure mode to sign stuff. It was locked. Now, you know, and the Microsoft thing was, no, we never intended to do that. That was just a bug. But I don't think it would have ever been fixed unless we would have had that big screen from everyone that says, no, we actually want more than just Microsoft on our computers. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of things. One of the things that is interesting to look at is there's actually a whole shell involved here. So you actually have a command line option for your BIOS. So at this point here, you can even go out and fix problems with your boot. If it can't find your disk or it can't find your signature, you can start loading things manually, just in case you felt like it. So another thing, and this is one thing that Brian did cover, is that it depends on a very small but very standardized file system. So once it has loaded it, the EFI will load a special file system and look for very specific files that is provided by the vendor. And those are the ones that are signed. And that we can actually take a look at that uh, once we get into our demos here. I need to go over to the right screen and then hit that guy. So, 
how we set things up. So a lot of it looks the same a little bit from the outside. There's still this turn on the box, wait for the little welcome thing to come up, and then you hit every key you're having until you find the particular key that that system uses. There are some biases, particularly for desktops, meant for home use, that just plasters a like a logo on the screen and hides those messages. And you have to like first hit escape to see them, or you have to go and find the key and then turn that splash screen off to see them. But it's usually like Dell F1 or something weird like that that you have to push to get in. And it does look the same, whether it's you know it's still a menu, whether it's UFI or BIOS today. But I guarantee you, most cases you are still doing UFI. It's loaded that way, it's still coming up that way, but you just have legacy modes turned on, so UFI will actually load a legacy bias without verifying it. And that's why we have, you know, unsecure boot and all that stuff around. So how do we actually get access to all of this? So I listed a lot of commands that can actually tell us what was discovered and how does it work. The first one is probably the most important, PMI decode. This is the command from your command line that will tell you exactly what the BIOS is thinking that your system has. So this contains all the hardware, all the firmware versions that you have, everything that that BIOS knows about your system. And a lot of that could also be a serial number, manufacturer's or a SKU number, whatever. So if you need to figure out what, where can I find a dryer from this mainboard, you can go in here with the DMID code, get the manufacturer and the actual specific model number for that board. And that's what you go and search for if it's not already in your BIOS. The last couple boxes that I had, main boards I got, the main board, literally in BIOS mode, I can hit update and it will log on online and download it. And I'm going, this is my OS almost, right? <laughs> but you can just look there and figure out, oh, I'm just this version, I, I just need to do it a little Google search or Bing search and then you're there. The other commands here are probably, some of them I think might be familiar to most people. Look at what's on the PC, PCI bus. Again, this is all the P and, and plug and pray stuff right, that we all are getting used to. It sees all the things that are plugged in. I don't have to tell it about it. It tells me what's there. And they're just available. Magic. It didn't used to be like that. I remember putting on sound cards once and they have to f move jumpers around and all kinds of other stuff. CD-USB devices that were discovered. LSCPU, um, you can certainly cat the CPU info in the proc directory, but one of the cool things about LSCPU, it condenses that to a, a single screen dump that tells you I found this many cores, this many capabilities, instead of having to decode that from that huge list you get from CPU information. Uh, I use that a lot when I have a new box. I, have, I don't know whether the CPU has the capability, for instance, to do hardware or virtualization. That's one of the things that I use that for very often. And um, for servers, it also will tell you how big a box do you have if you have licenses, that depends on how many calls you're running on, stuff like that. And, well, SCSI. So why would I ask SCSI there? We don't, most, does anyone have SCSI in their, hot, in their computers today? Still? Yes, sir. Wow. It's been a while. Well, one of the funny things about SCSI was it was a it's a great standard for interfaces. It really didn't matter what device you had. They were all talking the same language. So I don't know if you know this, but if you go on a hardware box and look at devices, they all start with ST for your block devices. Well, that's because it's simulating SCSI. Every device you plug in, even if it's not SCSI, will show up as SCSI devices because that's a very easy protocol to implement. And then you just have to map it to the different protocols you have underneath. It's actually very easy to do. So for instance, one of the things that is fun to do this, and if you're on a virtual machine, and it will show you CD and all that stuff as SCSI devices. Because that's what they are to it. Even though in your virtual machine setup, it's not listed as SCSI, but that's what it thinks about. So what are some of the key settings that we need to look for during boot? Well, the most basic is still the same. What is our boot device? Now, UFI changes that a bit because it doesn't really list devices, it lists known operating systems. But it's the same idea. What can you pick between? 
right? And you could have many different things to boot on a system. And the system needs to know out of the box which one to pick by default. Otherwise, it would never leave that menu if it has more than one to pick between, or you haven't told which one to pick. It'll just stand there and wait for someone to hit the key. And unless you're on a desktop, that's a bad thing to do. Another part that we need to make sure is there is one of those plug and play things is the advanced configuration of power interface. This is one of those things that's, that standardizes the way hardware talks to the world. And if it's not enabled, you may run into trouble. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but if you don't actually have to go far back to in the kernel history where one of the most common recommendations was to, was to turn ACPI off, right? And that was because you had legacy hardware and some of those implementations were not really nice yet. And this is one of the things, I, when I have time, which is very rarely, when I read kernel code, I look for comments. That's really all I look for. And looking at all the cursing done over hardware vendor stupidity <laughs> when it comes to implementing something like ACPI is funny. I mean, engineers will tell you straight up what, why things suck. And that's a lot of the patches and a lot of the issues that are happen happening on the kernel is how do we work around these bugs that these hardware vendors introduce and don't never fix. You can't, they, you know, they, these guys, is, they're open source guys. They will write the vendor and they will say, we found this bug, can you please fix it? And they won't. I mean, in the early days, they had a hard, it was a, it was a chip on the board. It was very hard to change. But today, it's just a software update. The view features, as I said earlier, make sure that virtualization extensions are actually enabled if you plan to use it for virtual machines. It's kind of important. Um, I think someone, uh, you mentioned that you have proper booting on USB, making sure that the right mode for the USB, if it's for booting or for access later, is enabled. Or a lot of the systems come up with legacy, which might turn off anything from USB 3 to uh, UFE, uh, uh, UFEI booting on that USB drive. So you've got to be careful, but doing that also changes the way the USB is seen by your system. So be careful. <laughs> they have different protocols now. It's not just a block device. And of course, do we run in full UFI mode or do we run in legacy mode? So the very first time we do things, we can't be secure. If I want to install new OS, how would the UFI know about my new OS? And this is the trick. So if you have a secure BIOS that is literally set up to not allow the system to boot unless it knows about it, you cannot install a new OS. Unless you have the password to lock on to the UFI settings or the BIOS settings, put it into, you can do that for now, mode. And then you boot up your installer that can then talk to the UFI system and says, please sign this as a known OS. And then once you come back up, you can turn that setting back on and now you're secure. But that will prevent anyone from plugging in a USB or CD in their computer and boot on it. Because they can't get to those settings unless they have your protected bias password. And that's the secure boot idea, right? We protect that part of the sector. So, all done, right? UFIs are done and we, we want to load our OS, right? That's the whole point. And as um, uh, Richard Stolberg keeps telling us, Linux is just a kernel, right? It's new Linux, it's because you know, what we consider Linux today is really all the tools around it. The kernel itself, most people don't see. But it is the first thing that really gets loaded that we can call Linux. I would argue that a lot of your stuff today also is Linux, but anyway, it's a different discussion. But the first thing that really happens once you fire the whole boot process is done is we need to load the kernel. We need to load the OS. So once that's loaded into memory and executed, a lot of funky stuff happens, but in essence, that is the sort of like the virtual environment of what we consider Linux today that gets initialized. It's uh, the kernel is always compressed. I don't know if you noticed that the, you know, the extension of it is like always GC or something like that. And that's because it just became so big. And 
Early on, it was so we could actually fit it on a floppy, and then the floppies were too small, and we still compressed them. But in essence, there's, there's a little piece of code in the beginning that takes part of the kernel and uncompresses it so it can actually execute it. And that piece is in the sample. It's kind of weird to look at, but it's fun. Um, so we initialize memory, it sets everything up, and then we need to get modules in, right? Because the kernel itself doesn't understand hardware yet, unless that's built into the kernel, which rarely happens these days. It needs to load additional files from the file system to even know how to talk to a hard drive, let alone network. All those are called kernel modules, and they also have to be loaded, first detected, loaded, and then initialized. Peter. Yes? So during the boot, all of a sudden you see all this stuff flying by mm -hmm. the mainline. That's what's happening at that yeah. point, correct? Um, More or less. Actually, a lot, all of this stuff yeah. is usually suppressed. You don't see it unless you turn on the uh, you say, don't be quiet. Right. There's a little parameter on the kernel line that says quiet, and all of this stuff used to fly by, yeah. and, but that is what happened. Well, actually, you won't see anything on there until I, it has like memory it and it has processes. Right. Right. But it is, it, if you go to and see what a kernel, well, basically says, I've now initialized this, I've now initialized that, blah, 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 blah. And if it goes, I have no clue what that means, but I'm going to go on anyway and put up warnings and all kinds of all funky stuff. That's what this is doing. But this line is really the most important part because in order for it to do the next, it has to have the module loaded to access the device where the root file system is. That's right. All the kernel is is memory structures. And once it's mounted the root device, it needs to execute PID1, which in this case will be system D. And then we have our boot process that has all those little, I'm starting X, I'm starting Y. That's usually what, what system D does. So the whole trick is, how do we get to this? Because at that point, we have no file system. Where do we put it? But the kernel has no clue what else is on the box. All right. Well, before we just, you, yes. Uh, following up on um, Rogers, I assume that most of what Roger is saying is, coming from system D, but what about in D messages? Does that have the material that's often suppressed? So D messages, messages is usually some of the, not all, uh, of the boot messages that you would have seen, yes, that just basically redirected to your log or D message or kernel message space, yes. So all those messages that you get, it could be even when you're running that goes, I got a weird error on the bus, it ends up in there. Stuff that usually end up in your console anyway is, hey, you probably have something you need to take a look at. But mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're going to take a look at when we look at debugging is how can we change that verbosity so we can actually see what's going on. There's a boot log that shows you the output. If it's set up right, yeah. yes. But the boot log may not be the kernel messages. It rarely no, 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 no. It's the output of all the yeah. services. And, and we don't have the system D, actually. You can always go back and see that. With the journal. Yeah. But yes. So where do we get the kernel from? Well, we've got to load it from somewhere, right? And this is what we find in slash boot. Now, that is, of course, not where it sees it when we boot. And that's going to be a very important distinction in a moment. But when we look at it from a system admin perspective, when the system is booted, that's where the files are. Oh, by the way, yeah. I doubt anyone here is to compile their own kernel today. Unless you're doing embedded devices, and even so, I don't think that's a common thing anymore. Gen 2 user. Oh, well, I, I feel that you, man. <laughs> Sorry. I'll have a sticker for you afterwards. <laughs> we manage our kernels using an RPM or dev package. This is really all we see today. We don't really see a lot more. But it's actually going to be interesting to see behind that one, two files that is the kernel, there are a ton of scripts that sets up your system, and those are the actually interesting things to look at on your system. Um, yeah, I, I wrote this up because I want to make sure everyone sort of has an idea of, well, a very typical example I've seen is people keep their slash boot 200 max or less, because that's what we did many, many, many moons ago. And then all of a sudden, an update it goes, I ran out of space. And you have no clue how to fix it. <laughs> um, this space is cheap today. 
This is, I would say, a minimal. And the reason for that is the more you, the more updates, particularly if you want to turn on debugging, that partition becomes important. So if you if it's not half a gig, I would say you can put a gig on it. You know, you have three terabytes of data on a, on a cheap disk. You're not losing anything. You know, keep it as you know, keep it big enough so you don't never have to worry about it. This is also important. Slash boot is not what we Microsoft worlds used to call the boot partition. It doesn't even have to be a partition. It can be a volume somewhere. It could even be on a network disk somewhere. It doesn't have, it doesn't care. But it is where the kernel lives and the results of any uh, It's a file system needed during the boot process. That's it. When you get your app disk, you no longer need to toggle bootable. We haven't needed to do that with Linux ever since it came out. It doesn't use that. That's for the DOS bootloader to look for. So if you never use Scrub and you just want to do a direct Linux boot where you plug that in the first part of the boot section in your partition, then it would need it because that's what that bootloader looks for. But that's it. Grub and anything Linux has never looked for that. Now it's important for UFI though. That's funny. Um, so we switch that back. We have a ton of options to the kernel. So that whole process for starting it up can be customized to the nth degree. That's part of what the installer does is to figure out what options to give it in a normal circumstance. But that's just, if you go in and look at this document, which is actually fairly old by now. When I looked at it, I could not believe it had been updated for a long time. It's hundreds and hundreds of parameters. I go here when I need to debug because I need to figure out what the parameter is. There's no way you can remember them all. But I'm going to talk about some of the main ones in this talk here. We set the parameter in doing for grub because grub, we'll get into that in a moment, is what loads the kernel. So that's where we give it the kernel parameters. So in grub, there might be a line like this. It tells it, you know, load this kernel, this long ass name, and all this stuff here after it are kernel parameters. And that can be as long pretty much as you want. I'm not aware there's any physical, technical limit to that. So, as I mentioned, what loads the kernel? It's Scrap. Grand Unified Bootloader. Love when people have <laughs> those kind of names. Um, its purpose is really to load the kernel and the RIN in it RAM. Because what was it I said about modules? The kernel is not capable of understanding all your hardware yet. And one of the reasons that I, I really like Linux is I don't have, okay, I'm 10 years behind on Windows, right? So I don't, back in my days with Windows, when I had to install it, not, did I, not only did I have to have my Windows disks, I had to have a Windows set of disks on the side just to get it installed because that's where all the drivers were. And without them, nothing would work. It barely would boot. In some cases, it wouldn't even boot because it could not understand the hardware that was on. Linux took a different approach. We wanted the core system to understand pretty much any hardware we had. So one of the things that the installer does is to load pretty much every driver in the world that it can come out of any module that is out there. If you look at how much it includes, it's like amazing. And it will start coping for everything out there, which is why it takes forever for it to start. And it will find, well, the kernel is already compiled to have those features. And then when it finds out what you have, it will just say, oh, en enable that, enable that, enable that, or provide that module. And the stuff you don't have, it doesn't enable. So it loses a little bit of space for point to somewhere that points to no code, but that's it. So it's actually fairly neat that we in Linux world don't need 50 million CDs, or at least a couple of others, to just understand your main board. In most cases, it will just boot. Yes? So you've got all that. Sitting there on your disk. Now. I'm sorry. You got all that stuff sitting there on your disk, right? So that is part of the installer. The, the, when you get your distribution, right. it all comes with it. 
and it figures out what you need of all the oh, stuff okay. that it can do, okay, and it, it only includes the bits, when, you, when it does the install on your hard drive, it only includes the bits that are needed, not all the stuff that is not. So if you don't have, let's say, well, I can come up with a sound card, it won't enable those pieces. If you don't have a standard ATA bus, because we haven't had that for a long time, it doesn't enable that module. And hence, it doesn't enable that and spend memory on that. It only enables the devices that you have, you have that was detected. That's the cool part. The bad part of that is what happens when you change hardware midway? So you know, two years after you install, you go, hey, something new came out. Let me put in this new video card. And you plug it in, and all of a sudden, your boot that just fails because you didn't run the installer to detect it. Now I have to do it manually. And you go, how the heck did they do that? And this is what we talk about today. Yes? There's Grub 1 and Grub 2. What's the difference? I'll get to that in a moment, but Grub 1 is old and buried and called legacy and shouldn't be used. Should, that not, be should used. not be used. Okay. Um, you will not find any support for it anywhere. It is so old, and every developer out there decided to just go away from it. The only ones that keep it is Red Hat because the old stuff that they promised support for for 15, 20 years still uses Grub 1. But Actually, what that meant was there's some developers at Red Hat here that has taken over the main maintenance of that. No one else does. And it just for patches. It's just if someone out there by accident finds a bug that would make someone be able to, you know, to get root rights to something else, that's what it will fix. They don't do anything else. So we talked about we need to get those modules. So other than loading the kernel, we also need a place to find those modules from. That's what the RAM disk is all about. That's its only purpose, is to provide those modules so the kernel can find the device that has the root drive and we can mount it. It only writes to meet read only. It doesn't have to have full clustering features and all kinds of other stuff. It just needs enough so it can find out, find that device that has the initial process to load. And that's not even live because we put that in the RAM FS because that's all the kernel understands, but it's a smaller version of it. It's extremely customizable. And I will get into some of those details later. It's just, well, it used to be a menu, meaning metadata. Today it's a script. And the cool thing is we actually don't have to write it ourselves, but it is just a script. So, as I mentioned, we need a RAM disk. And it sort of changed the name a little bit. This is, we, we, ended, we ended up on the initial RAM file system in the RAM FS as the name. This is what does all the initialization of all modules. This is what sort of uh, kickstarts our systems to life. It's where all the basic features of your OS is enabled. Um, it loads the modules that was identified. So that init RAM FS that you're, run, you're booting on in normal mode was generated based on a scan of your system to just enable what you need. It can even be set to just load the minimal bare not the full bulk of things that you need to run your whole system, but just the disk size. And that's it. But nowadays it also has network and all kinds of other stuff because some of us boots up network drives and all kinds of other things that makes that kind of tricky. Even has a huge graphical subsystem now because people like to see these graphic things flying over the screens and not all this text. So it has become pretty big. Uh, and I actually found out that the biggest part of it is the translations of all those messages. So it doesn't just speak English anymore. Um, but all this we already talked about. So there's gonna be a lot more details of this in a moment. So once we boot, and we load, we get all our processes, we get our full file system, that's sort of like a repeat of what we already did. So by those two together, when any RAM FS is done, it tells the kernel, here's the file system. It actually does a little trick. It changes the mounts live, because at that point, any RAM FS had the root drive. And it literally says, switch through, and I'm gonna pretend that you always run in the real system and then tells the, boot, the kernel to continue. The kernel has already booted. The kernel thought 
that it, it, that it was creating a real boot on a real disk. It did not. It started in RAMFS. And in RAMFS, the last job is to transfer control to hard drives in the process, which is where system D for, for real gets started. There is an NMD running under RFS that deals with getting there, and it gets replaced live. It's one of those cool things about Linux that we can do that I, have, I can't imagine doing a lot of our languages. You replace the active file system like that <laughs> and continue. So let's go in and look at some of the things that we do on, on Grub. So as I said, legacy Grub is no more. You should never have a new system you install with it on unless you're installing something that is five, six years old or older. You should not see legacy Grub anymore. Even if you have an old system like that, using the current versions of Grub should not be a problem. Most people see Grub as just the boot menu. And it is. It doesn't have to show a menu. It can just boot whatever you told it to and never show you a menu, but it is a menu. And you can put up a nice graphical screen. And that's why I admire Ubuntu folks, because this is where they start making Ubuntu more user friendly, I think, is that they come up with nice little logos. They really hide a lot of those crummy, rough text screens that we are, I mean, most of us are used to that have been doing this for a long time and make things very pleasant to look at without really knowing that that's what you see. So Grub2 is a stage bootloader. Now, without UFIE, we have two But with grouped, with, with UFI, we actually only have one. We skip the first two because that's UFI. So it's only stage two that is left for Grub when we have that. So it becomes much simpler. So, the, two, the three stages, and I'm not really sure why we, uh, I probably should have read up on that, but it's like stage one, stage one and a half, and then stage two. <laughs> so, very, very early on when we did not have to load a lot, we only needed two. We needed one to actually grab when the OS was loaded, or the, um, the, the BIOS left its mode, started the boot sector, that was the first stage, and then we had the real state elsewhere. Turned out that because we have so little room in the first sector, we needed a second stage to just get started. And so they, they needed something between one and one and two. So I guess that's engineers for you, like one and a half. Um, but in essence, what Grub is, it, it's located in three places on the traditional Grub, uh, in traditional mode. It's in the first sector of your disk. It's in right after the partition uh, first disk, and that's where stage one or one and a half is. And then it's on your slash boot device, that's stage two. So when you do an install of Grub, those are very important, those first two is what Grub install deals with. And if they're not there, you never get Grub up, and that's where it comes up and says, I can't find an OS. Or if they're mal configured, that's when you get those weird messages. Don't even give you a menu and you have no clue what happened because Grub never initialized. Once we get to uh, stage two, we read the configuration file, which is where you see your menus from and all that. That gets executed and that's what you then see. The other two stages are so small and fast that you, you won't even notice them. Unless you tell it to stop and pause between the steps, our computers are way too fast for us to even notice that happen. So what's in slash boot? So this is an example of a system that has EFI. So, and this is a pure install. Like I take a CentOS and install it, and that's what I get. If so, I had EFI in the system. They created three partitions. The first one is for the EFI. And this is the only fixed partition we need for EFI. Without that, EFI it doesn't work, because that's where it gets us executable from. Um, as you notice, it's in this case here, it's actually pretty big. Um, I've had one where it was just one meg, <laughs> but it um, doesn't really matter. It's a very small file system, and it is a boot partition. 
And this is meant, this is needed by URFI. I'm not sure why, because there's only one partition on every desk on that. So, but that's set. The second one, as there's no boot flag on, is our slash boot. Boot EFI is actually the first partition from a Linux perspective. So it mounts partition two as boot and mounts partition one as boot EFI. And then in this case, because I do as default, everything else is else. I could technically make, not true Anaconda though, but I could make number two here. I could make that an LVM too. But most people will keep it separate. So here, so if you look at boot, just looking at the directory, so this is what you're going to see. So under EFI, because this is a mount point, right? So EFI expects this structure on here. You saw that on an earlier slide. It starts with EFI, then boot. And because I think Microsoft created it, it's capital letters. I can't imagine any other vendor using my, uh, capital letters as a default. But, um, in the Red Hat's perspective, then there's the directory for all the Red Hat stuff, and underneath that is all the EFI files, all. It's like all. There's a small directory for an EFI system called GRUB2. If we don't hit EFI, everything on the GRUB2. Menu, the whole would change. If we have EFI, you will find all the grub stuff in this directory here. This is one of the biggest confusions you have when you go from a non-EFI to an EFI setup. Just those files disappeared on you. And if you don't know where they are, you're gonna go, holy crap, what did I do? If you now play with themes, by the way, it's about time you do. Themes is what I meant about when I admire what um, Ubuntu is doing in general is that that's how you make this very crude menu look pleasing. And the logos, even slight animations, makes snow and all kinds of other funky stuff. But it, you know, it's very customizable. It can actually be made to look like the whole system is up and running at that point. It's, it's not, but it can look nice. So how do we actually create our configuration? Now, we can change that grub CFG file if we wanted to, but if you look at the file, you will notice the first two or three lines in it is full of warnings about not doing that. Because the moment you run mkconfig, it will all write it. And you go, then what's the point of it? Well, that's because we have a file in, I thought I had it on this slide. I guess I don't. We have a file in etsy slash grub.d. Oh, we have actually multiple ones. Yeah. We have a directory, not a file, in Etsy called grub.d, where all the customizations that we want to make to grub needs to go. That directory is read and included by this command when it runs. So if I want to customize my grub menu, I should put my customizations in that directory, run this command, and then my customizations are going to be added to the standard file. If I don't, then the moment I get a new kernel update, the kernel update runs this command for me, and it will all write what there was in that file. Now, if you're just doing testing and going what works and what doesn't, yeah, you can change it and boot, it will stay. But just remember, the moment you do mkconfig, it scans your whole system for known OSs, including Windows. I'm not sure it will do some Solaris, but I can't imagine it wouldn't see there would be something recognizable. And then it comes to the menu and says, here's what I found. Go ahead, pick your stuff. I never had to do anything else. So for instance, if I have a dual boot situation where I did have Windows on my box, and for some reason or another, the Windows stuff disappeared from my menu, or even worse, Windows made a change, that means I need to change something in my configuration of GRUB. Never heard of it. But all I have to do is run mkconfig and it will find it and change it for me. I don't have to do it myself. If you're really into doing things by hand, Grappy is your friend. <laughs> That's a command shell or command line option to tell Grub to configure things. It can also be used to query. I would say it's really only 
interesting if you are creating your own install of something. So Grabby can be used, for instance, say, install this kernel in my menu. Or add this feature, add that feature, subtract this feature, subtract that feature. And it will go in and change the, the configuration file. This is literally what this does. It runs a lot of those. Another important command, again, on a non-EFI system, is the grub2 install. Notice the 2. You should not have a grub installed anymore. It is grub2. This is what initializes stage 1 and 2. Uh, so 1 and 1 and a half. So if for some reason your system will not find grub, go into recovery mode, run this guy to make sure that your boot drive has a valid version of grub. It's probably your first thing to do. That's the way to restore those back to whatever got all written. I have seen it all written by Windows many times in the past. And that's way back because I haven't used it for a long time. But, and I've seen other installers doing that on Linux too now. I can't say that this is a Microsoft thing anymore. But a lot of these installers just assume one in the world and just overwrite what's out there. So and that's when Windows would overwrite the master boot record. Yes. Right. And so does this guy, right? So I, I once thought that, well, when I run this, it will detect whether there's something there, and it, was, it will warn me, but it doesn't do that anymore. When I run this command, whatever's in that boot sector is going to be all written. And that's the exact same thing Windows does. So if you have your system and you have, go on and apply a big service pack from Windows, there's a very, very good chance it will write, all write the boot sector. And then you just have to fire this off again to get it back to grub. The equivalent of this command for EFI is called EFI Boot Manager. It's not as easy to use, but it's exactly the same thing. It tells, it, it queries you what EFI knows about your system. So it tells you about everything it found, what OS is it, as you can see, what's the new default. You can say to it, add an OS to the list, remove an OS from that list, change the sequence of what it needs to try. But it literally is just a matter of changing the entries into the EFI boot setup. So you don't install EFI because that comes from your BIOS, that comes from your you know, firmware setup. But you use this to configure EFI from a Linux perspective. So if there's if for some reason someone went on and removed um, <clears throat> your system from the EFI menu and you want to reestablish it. That's the command you would have to do to put it back. That's what the installer does when you run the first time, is to detect, hey, there's EFI, so it will add itself to the list. <clears throat> As I said, we will find the Grub CFG either in Grub 2 or here. Now, if you're on Ubuntu or SUSE, I think guys change the name to those. So they all have their own naming structures, so there's no conflict. Um, what you may, what, ah, actually I should have written that up. So this file here is always aliased in Etsy, or symlinked, or whatever you want to call that. So there's always a grub CFG in Etsy. And if you really want to know where the active file is, you just see where that symlink points to, and it will tell you exactly where that file is in the file system. It's created by, as I said earlier, the makeconfig, and as I said, I guess that's what I thought was on the other side. If you want to edit, uh, edit it, you change that directory. So this is an example of what Grub2 looks like. And this is why I think a lot of people didn't like about the new Grub when it came out many, many years ago. Because this menu here is a lot more codey <laughs> than the legacy Grub was. The legacy Grub was basically just stating something in the sense of give me a menu name, show me the kernel, show me the Init ID and then go on. We actually have a lot of things. This is literally a program. You, you, if you recognize these curly brackets, this is code. Grub has its own shell. So if you really want to do a manual boot, and for some reason you have a backup of this, you can read somewhere. But Grub gets you into the boops shell. All you have to do is fire the command one by one, as you see them there, and then add. At the very last, right after that, you need to say boot. And then you're doing exactly what this is doing. 
So that's another way of recovering. I would say there's probably no need to initialize a nice little video with a GUI that shows booting and all kinds of other stuff. But you certainly would have to initialize your partition tables and your file systems. But that's it. It is actually pretty simple to get, get this up and running. Let's look at the Rockard stuff. So it, it's a small root device. It's right in memory. It's loaded by, uh, by Grub and then passed on to the kernel as here's your file system. Um, all your init RAMFS files are located in slash boot where also you also will find all your kernel files. And, well, not really a version because the menu says load this file, load that file. But they don't have the same version, you're going to get mighty confused. And that's what the archive will do by default. It will say, give me the version of the kernel you generate the file for. It will have the exact same name, well, version number. So 